guys, this is Amanda with Bring the Zoo to You at Brookfield Zoo. And today, we're gonna be going over some of the animals we have in our spawn building. Now, I'm a bird keeper here, so we're gonna be talking about some birds in particular, and we'll go through them as we go through the exhibit. We're in our swamped area where we're covering an area that covers uh, basically central to North American and South American swamp creatures. Now, it's kind of a dark exhibit, and the reason being is they're very active when it comes to breeding at this time of the year. So we're going to be talking about the individual species and what they've been up to since the zoo has been closed. So a quick peek of the animals we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at a boatbill heron, looking at a snowy egret, a Brazilian teal duck, a blue-crowned motmot, Venezuela trupial, and then a sun bittern. Now, with the species we can focus around, you see they're all perched in different areas. With the activities that have been going on right now, with the zoo not being very open to the public, we do have some birds that are breeding in this exhibit. Looking up over that perch, we'll see that boat-filled heron, and below him will be a sun bittern. There we go. In North America, we do have bitterns, they're North American bitterns, but they're much larger than this species right here. The sun bittern is going to be found in Central and South America. It's a species that has a very whistle-like call and a special display. Now, we house sun bitterns at two of our buildings here at the zoo. We have them at, at Feathers and Scales and also in the swamp. Now, they're more going to be in brushy-like areas and also going to be in swamp-like areas as well, where they'll eat crustaceans, they'll eat insects, small reptiles, and also any small mammals they can catch as well. Now one cool thing about the sun bittern is when they spread out their wings, they have special patterns on there that help attract the female and they'll display to her, they'll hold their wings out nice and wide, and they have eye spots, almost like a moth, on their wings. Now as he's looking around, you'll see we talked about inventories a while back when I talked over in reptiles and birds, and this bird also has bands. Looking at him individually, on the right side he has a metal band and a colored band on the left side. This means this is our male sun bittern. Our female is a little bit below over by the dock down there, just watching to see what's going on with two people here chatting about these birds. <laughs> now as you scan across the exhibit as well, we do have some white birds. Those are going to be our snow egrets. In this in particular exhibit, we do have six females. No males, but they still participate in breeding behaviors because it's a natural ability for them. So you don't always need males in this exhibit for these sun, uh, snow egrets to go ahead and breed. A good example is if we walk over to the right here. We do have a nice nest in the back of the exhibit, but we do have a female on it currently. So if we kind of zoom on in a little bit, and if again, there we go. Uh, so we're by up there. <laughs> We have some noisy boat valerians, but we have a female on a nest. Now that nest is made of different wood twigs and branches that we have put in here. We do actually have to load this exhibit with cut sticks every year and every breeding season to make sure they can choose their individual twigs and branches that they like for their own nest. Now that female, she has been laying eggs. They are not fertile, there's no developments, there's nothing inside those eggs as far as embryos or future chicks go but we still let her go through the natural process of the nesting every year. It takes about 25 to 28 days, I believe, for the species to go have a full incubation period. So once that time is over, she'll realize that she's not going to be a mom and she'll get off the nest and presume her, active, her natural active activities on exhibit. Now, I mentioned we have some other birds breeding in here and that's kind of the other exciting part. We do have breeding pairs of both built herons. We have four boat of herons in total. If you scroll up to the nest there, we do have a male and a female standing guard, or a male on the outside there, is standing guard of the female currently nesting on eggs. Now they can lay up to about four eggs in their nest, and you'll see their nest is also on that platform loaded with sticks. Now they're still in the process of building more nests. They're very particular about what sticks and branches they will put up there. So although we've loaded the area with a ton of branches, they've only selected the ones they want. So if they don't like them, they toss them in the pool, I go and I collect them and I switch them out for brand new ones. 
We've also been trying different up materials like, for example, we'll cut up some palmettos, let them dry, leave the stems out for the birds to choose if they want to use them this time around, and also with bamboo shoots as well. Now we have the two pairs, and we do have a female over in the right corner. It's a bit darker, but she is sitting on about three to four eggs at this time. Now she's watching us intentionally because she knows we're here and she's trying to protect her nest and incubate those eggs. Currently, you can see her, she's actually sitting on two eggs and the two are next to her, but she may shift those around in a little bit. Now dad is going to be up on the tree branch over there, once again, watching and observing to make sure we stay far enough away from his female and his nest. Now what we do here with breeding, it's a natural behavior our birds go through we do have to make sure that they're getting the right dietary supplements that they need and also the right amount of diet that they need. And for these in particular birds, the boat-billed herons, they are more of a nocturnal eater. So they're going, a nocturnal hunter, I should say. They're gonna go out and ahead and eat fish, small invertebrates, crustaceans, anything they can get those nice boat bills, bills on. They're called boat bills because they're a bit wider and more spoon-shaped with a bit of a point at the top there. So they will go ahead and use that whenever they have too many birds around them or trying to defend their area. They'll actually clap their bills together, which makes a very clear clapping and almost a slight honking noise to let those other birds know that, hey, you're too close to my nest, please stay away. One cool fact about them too is they do have plumage that can turn into a crest if they're excited or once again, protecting their nest area or even attracting a mate, they can stick up their back crest head feathers. It's almost like a crest and crown that's nice and black, almost kind of like a mohawk. Right now, they're pretty calm and relaxed, which is what we want when we're around them in the exhibits. So they probably will not display that crest. Now, with them going ahead and entering the breeding season and currently nesting, what we do is we calculate how many days from the first day that they started nesting to the full incubation process, for them it's gonna be 21, 23 to 28 days, just depending on when the egg was laid and also that pair itself. What we calculate from the first day they nested and first day that they laid an egg, or we estimate that they laid an egg, to when they're actually going to have potential chicks hatch out of those eggs. So when we, we have a good estimate of when that's gonna happen, we can further increase their food or offer a few more varieties of food items for them to choose to feed their chicks. Now, one thing that we also have to do is we do supplement their diets. We go ahead and we provide them with vitamins and also calcium carbonate, which is something that we will give them to help them prepare and put all the extra calcium carbonate back into their bodies for when they are laying eggs. Since eggshells, do you have a high density of the calcium, or sort of a bunch of the calcium from the females in them? Now, once the chicks are laid, or hatched, I should say, then we can go ahead and switch supplements to offer the chicks additional supplements to their diets to make sure they're getting everything that they need to develop properly. Now, as we see, our sun bitterns are on the floor over there. They are looking to see what they can find. They're foraging. Um, I did put some crickets out there, so they might actually be hunting to see if they can catch some crickets. Now, as they do that, those are, these are our three fish-eating species here, the sun bittern, the snow egret, and the bopo parents. But we also have addition, three other species on exhibit. We have the blue crown mot mot, the Brazilian teal ducks, and the Venezuela trupials. That's why the trupials right now are being a little bit quiet. They were calling earlier, but they may flash by later. They have the bright yellow and orange body with black wings and a black head. Currently, oh, there might be one over in the yeah. corner. He might dart in and out. He's very hard to see. <laughs> they are paying attention to that corner because I went ahead and loaded a bunch of messy materials for them to use and be interested in and play with over in that corner. We also went ahead, oh, they're calling right now. That is the male calling for the female. We also went ahead and placed a nest in the top corner behind that ridge over there because the Venezuela trupials are parasite nesters, which means that they're going to go ahead and find a nest of their own, or I shouldn't say parasite nesters, that's a different term, but they are going to essentially steal another bird's nest 
they're going to add to it and turn it into their own before they go ahead and lay their own clutch of eggs. We were fortunate enough that we have two breeding pairs of Venezuela trupials here at the zoo. And the first pair were successful. They had chicks over at Reptiles and Birds this past year. And unfortunately, we're, a tree branch fell and the nest itself fell out of the tree, but it did not have any eggs in it, did not have any chicks in it at the time. The pair had stopped using it. But we were able to collect that nest, salvage it, and bring it over here to place up high for the trupials to be interested in and check it out to see if they would like to go ahead and steal that nest and proceed to use it as their own. Funny enough, this nest that we have and propped up a certain way was originally a red vented bulbul's nest that was commandeered, per se, by <laughs> the trupials over reptiles and birds. Now with them, they've been interested in some nesting materials and they've actually dug a bunch of nesting materials out of the nest, but we have not seen any active nesting at this time, but we're keeping our fingers crossed. Now let's see, over to the right here, we do have our mot mot. This is our blue crown mot mot. This bird is gonna be found in Central and South America. It can also be found in different ranges of Mexico as well. Um, while it's not necessarily a swamp bird, it is a bird that you would see by well, bodies of water. And not essentially just bodies of water, but rivers. Mot mots are known for burrowing into river banks and creating their nests over there. This bird in particular was hatched here at Brookfield Zoo. It was actually uh, laid, originally as an embryo, laid in a burrow over underground at reptiles and birds that its parents had dug. Now we did move him over here and he's enjoying a very nice life here just with all the different water. He's used to going after the crickets that we provided for the trupials and for the sun bitterns. And he's doing pretty well having a nice water environment too. And he's the only one we have on here right now and that's okay. Um, he's not quite of age for breeding, so he's not missing out on any females or males just yet. Now as we scroll down a little bit here, we do have our two ducks. These are our Brazilian teal. The first one you see is our female. She has those lovely orange feet and a little bit of teal sticking out, green teal sticking from her wing as she shakes her plumage in her tail. Over to the right we do have the male. He's known for having very vibrant and teal. <laughs> She, she flops up for us. She's showing off her feathers as I'm talking about She's him. very excited. Um, he also has that, these brilliant teal wing feathers. I can show you once again with the card. So these guys, true to their name, being from Brazil, they're not just from Brazil, but they can go ahead and migrate up and down from central to south, uh, central to north of the South America continent. So typically this is a breeding pair here. Um, they can be found in flocks of up to 20 birds. Now, speaking of flocks, all these birds in this exhibit are pretty interesting, not only just because they look cool in themselves, they have, they're cool in their own identities, but some of them don't just stay in one place during the year. Now, our snowy egrets, for example, are migrating birds, and they have a special story behind them. Our snowy egrets have very cool plumage that it's very white, as you can see, and pretty because it's almost tassel-like towards the ends. They have a nice coat of plumage that keeps them nice and warm and protected, but they also have some fancy feathers around their neck and also down their backs as well that people went ahead and used in the early 1900s and, and so for use as decorations and on their hats. Now, some of us recall the story of way back when I learned it in elementary school myself of how ladies were decorating their hats with all different types of exotic feathers and unfortunately that actually put a pressing foot on the populations of bird in, birds in the wild because people were hunting the birds for the feathers to put on decorations or for design and fashion in general. Well these birds are special because right now they're doing, oh they're showing all this lovely plumage I was talking about. <laughs> they're doing fairly well, they're at least concerned in the wild but it took quite a while to make sure that they'd be at that status because they were hunted so much that for those feathers, that it became a, a huge impact on their population. Now, I believe in 1916, the Migratory Bird Act was put into effect and that limited what birds could be commandeered or hunted or even held or even feathers being held in a, without a permit or being sold and moved around the country. Now, I think there's up to 1,000, if not 2,000 birds on that list today, but there's only a handful of them on the list back then. These birds would be one of them. 
Now with their feathers being as they are, they do have to preen and clean and make sure that they are well taken care of. They have special oil. All birds have a special oil and a special gland they use to go ahead and clean their feathers, spread oils in the feathers to make sure that they stay fairly nice and bristled together, but also that the water does not completely absorb into their feathers and weigh them down. Now the snowy egrets, I mentioned that they, they basically are pretty cool cool creatures in general, but they don't just stay in one spot all year round. round. They can be found in Florida, they can also be found in Central and small part of South America, but they don't stay in one place. For these birds in particular, they have a breeding season, they have a wintering season, and then they have a common year-round season too. So that means you can find them in different locations depending on the time of the year, and in particular more related about the seasons of the year too. Now, for them, being found in Florida, they can also be moved down and have more breeding and uh, more wintering in Central and Central America and a bit of South America too, but they will breed a little bit more closer to the southern uh, part of the United States. And then some of them can be found all year round in Florida, as long as the weather stays nice for them down there. Now, the Motmut's kind of looking at us. He's also eyeing to see if he can find some of the crickets. <laughs> Now with this exhibit in particular, we do go ahead, we keep a mister going to keep humidity high. Humidity is much important for birds that are found in swamp and marsh-like areas, or even river areas as well, and considering the mot mot. The troupials themselves, they do a very good job of hanging out here on this exhibit. Oh, and our mot mot <laughs> just caught a cricket. Yeah. Maybe we'll be able to watch him eat it. Our troupials aren't actually found in swamp or marsh-like areas. They're gonna be found in more uh, dry shrublands and even some deserted areas, but do, they do a very good job living on this exhibit. The humidity still works for them just so, and they enjoy all the extra crickets, like I said, that I put out here for the sun bitterns and the mot mot. How do you know how many eggs are laid in a nest since they're all the way up at the top of the walls? That's a good question. We don't always know. Um, luckily enough, there's been enough research done on these species that they generally have an idea of how many clutch, how eggs in a clutch they can have. So from the start of the first egg lay, usually it's an egg a day that's laid. We can kind of make the assumption and the estimate that at a certain day they should have all four eggs in their clutch, but we could also be off. Sometimes they're only gonna lay two in a clutch or three in a clutch. It's all based on the individual bird. Gotcha. Fortunately for me, I am a tall person and can <laughs> see at different angles and I can tell you um, Typically, when I can visually see an egg underneath the mesh bottom of that nest, I can go ahead and identify that, yes, we have an egg. Gotcha. But either way, we're going to calculate, if we see them nesting, we're going to calculate an estimated hatch date for the birds, and we'll just have to wait and see. So if we don't see an egg, we're still going to treat it like they have eggs, just in the, um, the case that they do have chicks. So we're, we're less surprised, and they're less surprised too, because they're expecting us to provide them more fish and more... Uh, diet, dietary supplements for what they need to go ahead and feed their individual offspring. Who's making that whistling noise? So that's going to be our male sun bittern. Um, it's pretty cool. He's calling to me, let his, know, his female know that I'm here. Check me out. And he's also calling to let her know and let us know, I see you guys. You cannot surprise me. I see you <laughs> right there. Uh, how many total birds are here in the swamp? That's a good question. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but let me do a quick cap. So you guys can finish the math here, but I have the six snow egrets, the four, so that's 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 in this exhibit. Oh, 16, 17 with the ducks. Did you forget the ducks? I forgot the ducks. <laughs> they will not let me let it down now, but 16 in this exhibit. We're going to go ahead and have seven ibis in our other exhibit with four, uh, four ducks, one frivolous whistling duck, three rosy-billed spoon, uh, my goodness, rosy-billed Picard ducks. Um, moving over to our other exhibit, we do have four spoonbills, roseate spoonbills, now I got that word going for me. Uh, we do have a northern female cardinal, a northern oriole, we have a great egret, which is much larger than our snowy egrets. And great egrets are more common to North America. They can actually be found in this state, in Illinois. These guys are not going to be found in Illinois, Illinois unless they come up for 
a special kind of blow off by the wind or up on the Mississippi for migration, but they're going to be found more in the, uh, further south in the state. Um, but we have the great egret over in the other exhibit, and then we have two female wood ducks, one female red-headed duck, um, three teal, one three teal ducks, so green-winged teal, blue-winged teals, yeah, blue -winged. I can't remember, I have to look at the card again, but green-winged teal ducks. Uh, one female, two males, and what else? I'm trying to think. Oh, we have three other species that we current, or three other individuals of a different species that we currently hold there, just temporarily. So that's kind of what we got. We got a small handful, but they do fill up the exhibit, and we also make sure that there's enough room in the exhibit before we put the birds in there. Once again, make sure they have enough space to claim as their own territory, so that they aren't going to be pestering each other too much or pushing each other around. Right. Do uh, the birds that hatch out, do they eventually go to other zoos? So, oops, excuse me, that might be the case. It just depends on the species um, and also depends where there's room and availability. Occasionally, we do have enough room to hold the animals here for their life unless they are considered a high, high on the list for breeding recommendations. Typically, any of our birds that are hatched out here do not leave the zoo right away. They're going to stay here for the first year of their life just to make sure that they're healthy and that they've been developed and they're strong and have a good sense of what's going on around them. If we were to send out a younger chick, it could be very, very shocking to them and a little bit more stressful than if we were to send them out as adults. Um, some of the birds we do send up and coordinate to other zoos and aquariums. Um, and we just have a good recommendation. We follow breeding recommendations. We also follow if they're looking to open a new exhibit or they have room in an exhibit and we don't have room in an exhibit, then we can coordinate with them to make sure that bird goes over there and that's the best case situation, best, I apologize, best <laughs> case, best situation for the individual species when it comes to the social dynamics and possible breeding situations that they are going to be housed in and involved in. Are there ducks in any of the other um, buildings? There are. So we do have three of our ducks over at Reptiles and Birds. Those are three male teal ducks, uh, blue-winged teal ducks, and they actually hatched out here several years ago. I think they're about five years old now, but their mother and father originally were in this building. Hmm. Um, at what point do you check on newly hatched chicks? So it just depends on the species. We try to have a hands-off approach, unless it is a bird that we are hand-rearing or assist-rearing. Assist-rearing means that we allow the parents to raise that chick, but we can go ahead and offer it supplemented feeding schedules or feeding items. So for example, um, if a bird's doing really well, like a penguin, and we know mom and dad are feeding it, we may sneak in there and offer the bird a few more extra fish in the day to make sure it's still keeping up with the amount that it needs. Yeah. Make sure that parents are doing the right job. For these birds in particular in this exhibit, we would not interfere. It would be more doing observations from afar. They are, at this point, very, what do you call it? They're very aware that we're here and they would not enjoy us coming. It'd be a little too <laughs> stressful if we were to interact with them and help them raise their chicks. So it's better if they were to do it on their own, but we provide them all the different items that you need from different food variety, the right amount of food, and also any breeding materials that they might need along the way. I see one of the troopials has joined us all the way in the back. Yeah. So the female does have a pink band. I think the male has an orange or purple band. I'm not having a hard time seeing. All right, guys. Well, thank you for joining me, Amanda, with our lovely swamp birds here at the Swamp Building. And once again, thanks for joining us for Bring the Zoo to you at Brookfield Zoo.